ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Faces of Carlsbad. And we're sponsored by Broadband. And you can get everything here if you want it. Well, you can even get our, uh, our autographs if you want. I doubt it, though. We're not here all the time. But anyway, this is coming to you on Channel 23. And uh, as you know, we introduce people that you might know, people that you've never met before. But today I know I'm going to be talking to a gentleman that everybody knows, or at least they've met one way or the other. And I'm referring to my very good friend, Pastor David Rogers. Ro David? How you doing? It's good to see you, Mike. Oh, it's great to be seen. Well, you, you, you've been so busy with so many things lately. Uh, I, I, I don't sleep. You know. No. <laughs> I was going to ask you, how many hours uh, a night do you average in, in sl uh, sleeping? I, I'm actually I'm, I'm go doing good to get seven. And I focus on getting at least seven hours of sleep, mm -hmm. to be quite honest with you. Well, you're doing better than I do. I'm, I'm <laughs> lucky if I get six. <laughs> well, as you know, David, we uh, go back to your grandparents, and uh, then we gradually come up to your parents in uh, present-day life. So where, where did your uh, grandparents, where were they born? Kentucky. In Kentucky. All of my family originated in Kentucky. Oh, that's the neighbor state of Ohio. Yes. Yeah. Well, we were neighbors then. Our family legacy goes back in Kentucky before uh, nationhood. Is that right? Yes. And where did they come over from England? or uh, England and Scotland. England and mm -hmm. Scotland. Now, have you traveled to both those countries yet? I haven't been to Scotland yet, but I have been to England, and I absolutely loved it. it England is beautiful, and Scotland, you, you'll be yes. delighted if you get over there because it's a beautiful place, too. I had the chance to go to England. Uh, you know, Guy Lutman would love this, but I got the chance to go to England several years ago and, and see uh, Eric Clapton in the Royal Albert Hall. So. Oh, the Royal <laughs> Albert Hall. My goodness so, gracious me. Did that with, with great status there. Yeah. Well, it was well, really I, fun. When I was over there, I went to uh, uh, 23 Baker Street, you know, and mm -hmm. I was looking for Sherlock Holmes, but I somehow wasn't able to find him. He and was out solving a mystery. I'm yeah, sure. and Dr. Watson was working <laughs> with some patients. <laughs> so, and they came over from England, settled in Kentucky. I yes. wonder, uh, why did they pick out Kentucky? That's fascinating. Well, my great, 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 I don't know how many great grandfathers back, Edmund Rogers, mm -hmm. was a surveyor, and he was sent out into the territory of Kentucky to so help survey the land out and ended up settling down there, and, and the family has been in Kentucky ever since. And they're still there now. I still have family there, yes. Oh, my gosh. Where, uh, what city? Any? Louisville and Glasgow, Kentucky, mm -hmm. mainly. <laughs> now, I've been to Louisville, but I miss Glasgow. Yeah. That's where the Scottish influence comes from. You got in. it. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, boy, well, anyway. No, London, uh, talking about London, it's a fascinating city. Yeah. And it, I found it to be an interesting city to walk around in, too. As, as busy it is, as it is, what, seven, eight million people, but it's a nice city to walk in. It, you know, it's so friendly out there, and, yeah. and, and it's just a fun place, and, and all of the goings and comings around there, and, and they've got that tube system that makes getting around town so easy, so efficient. It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I, I'd love to go back sometime soon. Well, it's certainly more efficient than Boston's uh, in the past couple of weeks, but poor Boston had to shut theirs down for a while because of the well, snow. snow happens, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> so anyway, you, uh, when did you move to Carlsbad? I moved to Carlsbad in 2001 mm -hmm. and uh, actually moved to, to Eddy County in 1999, but I was in Artesia for a short time before moving here. Mm -hmm. But I've been here since 2001. And what, what attracted uh, you to this beautiful city? Uh, First Christian Church. Uh, they, they were looking for a pastor, and I was looking for a church, so uh, it, it worked out well. And here, 13 years later, I, I am very happy where I'm at, and I, I hope they're very happy. I think they're very happy with me. I, I have no, no desire to go anywhere else, so here I am. Now, what uh, drew you to becoming a preacher? God. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, a, and it was an amazing calling. I, I was in the Coast Guard at the time and, and was working on board the ship as a chaplain's assistant to uh, help provide worship services while the ship was at sea mm -hmm. in absence of there being a chaplain on, on board that, that cutter. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I was leading the morning services, and my faith has, has very long been the central core of my life. But a lot of the crew were saying, you know what? You know, you're, you're helping us on the ship, and you're doing a great job. 
but do you really think you should be a, a pastor? And I, I had every reason why. There's no way I can be a pastor because of all this stuff. I was mainly a cook. That's what I did on board the ship. Was now, what was the name of your uh, cutter? The Coast Guard Cutter Midget. It's a 378-foot uh, high-endurance cutter that was based in Seattle, Washington. Oh, so you were on the West Coast. I was on the West Coast and the East Coast. I did both coasts. But uh, on this particular tour, we were out of Seattle, and we were up in Kodiak, Alaska uh, for a couple of days, resupplying, refueling. And I told God, I went to the chapel there, I said, God, there's no way I can be a preacher. It requires extra schooling. I don't have the resources. I've got a good job. I've got what I need, you know. But... God just kept saying, it's okay, I'll take care of you. So then I went for a long walk, and uh, that walk took me to the top of a very tall hill or a very small mountain, I don't know how you want to describe it, with a pretty uh, sharp cliff that, mm -hmm. that drops over into the bay. So for the longest time, I was standing there looking down at my cutter, it looked like a little toy boat there <laughs> in the harbor. <laughs> does. And um, while I was staring at that, uh, boat or the ship, I did not realize what was happening 20 feet in front of me just beyond the threshold of the cliff until I looked up and 20 feet, 15, 20 feet in front of me soaring on the updrafts were three bald eagles just effortlessly looking at me. Wow. And I saw the eagles and I, I saw them and I knew at once that that was the confirmation I was I was desiring. The scripture says, I will bear you up on, on the wings of an eagle, oh my. and you shall run and, <laughs> and not grow weary, and you shall walk and not grow faint. And, and I saw that, and that scripture came to mind, and I just said, thank you. I, I'll do this. So I applied, and, and at the end of my enlistment, I was able to then start seminary, and I did that in Lexington, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And then after seminary, I came to Artesia and then Carlsbad. Uh, you went to the University of Kentucky? No, I went to Lexington Theological Seminary oh, in, see. Lexington. in Lexington. It was right across the street from the University of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So I spent some time on that campus, but my degree is from Lexington Theological Seminary. Well, that's, that's <laughs> fascinating. And then you, getting back to that uh, Coast Guard cutter, how, how many years were you in the Coast Guard? A little over four years. Mm -hmm. Four years, four and a half months. And I was stationed in New Jersey for half that time, working on a small boat station, uh, doing uh, small boat patrols in and around New York Harbor, mm -hmm. and a couple of temporary assignments to a Coast Guard cutter out of, out of Sandy Hook, New Jersey. We went all up the New England coast. Oh, yes. And um, <clears throat> at one point in time, we went out after a very, very horrible storm. It was just a brutal storm. And uh, I was on the cutter at the time, the Coast Guard cutter ADAC. Mm -hmm. We went out into the North Atlantic to search for a vessel that had gone down in a storm. And that storm is now known today as, as the perfect storm. We were looking for the Andrea Gale, uh, the vessel that was featured in the book and the movie called The Perfect Storm. So I was in that storm. And Star George Clooney. Did you find any? Uh, Never. Nothing? No. The, the, there was a few barrels and some sundry items that floated off that were discovered, but we never found the vessel or uh, its crew. How many men went down with uh, this? Eleven. Eleven. It's uh, kind of amazing that we're talking about this right now, but I'm reading a book about the Titanic. <laughs> and it was uh, so many reasons why it went down or who was at fault. And, and you know, you wonder. And it brought up the fact that the ship was going much too fast in an iceberg mm -hmm. area. And, uh, and yet the captain <clears throat> of the ship, E.J. Smith as they called him, he went down with the ship. He did. And he didn't make any effort to try to get off. And uh, I, I think about these, through the years I've kept records of ship disasters around yeah. the world and airplane disasters. But I think about these people who go down to the sea and give up their lives to protect other people. You read The Perfect Storm. It's a very descriptive book. Sebastian Younger wrote it, and mm -hmm. it, it chronologizes the lives of those men that went down with the Andrea Gale in, in very vivid... It's, it's a wonderful read. I, I highly recommend that. Well, I was in the Navy um, Reserve for seven years after I... many years after I got out of the Army, and uh, I was on the Steinecker, destroyer Steinecker, out mm -hmm. of uh, Norfolk, Virginia. 
And we were off the coast of North Carolina, and you know they get some pretty nasty storms off the yes, coast they of do. North Carolina. And that ship was going up and down and up and down. And I went in to grab a sandwich after I got off my watch duty. And uh, the, uh, the young guys came in, and they were, oh, they were really under the weather. They just, and they said, Dad, they called me Dad because I was older than they were. And they said, how could you stand this storm? And I said, there's nothing to worry about. You just go with the waves. You know? <laughs> and they looked at me, and they just shook their heads. They couldn't believe it. <laughs> the worst I saw was 65-foot swells, and that was up there in the North Atlantic, not too far from where the Titanic went down. Oh, my goodness. And I have to say, I was a little seasick that day. 65-foot <laughs> 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 swells, it'll tear you up. Yeah, we went, we went across from... Uh, northern Scotland to uh, the Shetland and Orkney Islands and we ran into a horrible storm and the waves were coming up into the second deck and uh, most of the pe passengers were on the floor just trying to you know grit their teeth yeah and this one woman came up to me and she said they're a sickly looking lot aren't they and she <laughs> with that Scottish <laughs> accent and I said oh yes they certainly are but it doesn't bother me and she said, it doesn't bother me either and we just watched those waves hit the glass and, but uh, I just I guess I have a stomach for it. And there's nothing quite like the sight of seeing that bow hit a wave and actually submerge. Yes. And then, oh, it's just a, yes. it's amazing. Yeah. Do you ever have any uh, chances to go back and see some of your old friends from the Coast Guard? I've interconnected with a few of them on Facebook, mm -hmm. but uh, I haven't had a chance to, to greet, meet up with them. There's not a whole lot of Coast Guard veterans in Carlsbad, you know. No, no. That's there's a few of us, but no, not a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah, I just mm -hmm. got a letter from him here a couple of weeks ago and wanted to know if I would uh, support them, and I'm going to, because I, <coughs> I, I like to support all men in the service. Yes. Anyway, uh, then you came to Carlsbad, and you, uh, you came in, you were into Artesia first. You were yes. working to, in a church up there. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you got the good news down here. We got to come down here and <coughs> haven't left. And how many years have you been a pastor at the First Christian Church? Now? Thirteen. Thirteen. That's a lucky number. Yes. <laughs> because I was in room 13 at Eddie School all those okay, years. There you go. And we're still surviving. It's, it's <laughs> easy for me to remember because I, was, I, I moved here two weeks before my youngest daughter was born, and she's 13, so I've been here 13 years. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Now, you also have a daughter at uh, Eastern New Mexico University. I do, yes. Yeah, she's a junior in the broadcasting program that at Eastern and mm -hmm. uh, works at the radio station out there and works at actually two different radio stations in Portales. Mm -hmm. Doing well. She's a 2010 graduate of Carlsbad High School. Oh, yes. So, it's those daughters, they bring a lot of joy into Father's Oh, yeah. Life, I they? love all my kids. Yeah. <laughs> now, you have a son also, right? Uh, two, actually. Two three. Son, three sons. Yeah, I've got my, my son, Jacob, and I've got two stepsons as well. Mm -hmm. So be, between the five of them, my wife and I stay really busy. Oh, I can imagine <laughs> so. Yeah, I was talking to a lady who's now a new grandmother and uh, she, the other day, and she said that, oh, as a grandmother, I thought I was busy as a mother, but no, <laughs> this can't even compare. I'm so busy now, I don't know whether I'm coming or going. Oh, but it's a labor of love. I'm a grandfather, and I love it. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's yeah, great. It's wonderful. Well, I know you're very busy every Sunday. Yes. And probably, and you're doing other jobs, too. Now, tell me, what else are you doing now besides uh, your pastoring on Sunday? Well, NMSU Carlsbad has been very gracious to, to pick me up as an adjunct faculty over there, and so I'm up on the hill several times a week teaching history and communication and public speaking and sociology. So wow. uh, as, as the need arises, it's been very good. So you are interested in sociology and history, huh? Yes. What kind of history are you delving in right now? Uh, European history, actually. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, the European freshman history class that's required and, and uh, love teaching that. Uh, then there's also the uh, the sociology class that we're just now developing, and we're going to unveil that next week in a short eight-week class. Uh, sociological perspectives on death and dying. I mean, very interesting class. Death and, and death and, and dying. dying. Yes. Oh, dear. 
Well, let's not bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dead issue. What can I say? I, it's a dead <laughs> issue. Yeah, right, David. <laughs> Boy. Well, what do you do in your spare time? And I know you don't have much spare time, but tell me what you're involved in. My favorite is, is just reading. I love to read, go on walks with my wife. Some, all frequently, you can just see us walking around holding hands because mm -hmm. she's beautiful, and I love to walk and hold her hand because it's lots of fun. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I love to read uh, and, and write. Reading and writing are, are my two... Uh, relaxation passions. I've been writing for the current Argus for uh, 12 and a half years now. Yes, I know it. I read your articles every week. 12 and a half years I've been yeah. doing that. <clears throat> now, do you read uh, other things besides uh, books on Christianity? And oh, yeah. I, I read all sorts of fun stuff. Sometimes it's fiction, sometimes nonfiction, mostly nonfiction. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if it's, I've always got a book nearby. <laughs> I'm the same way. I can put. And I'm usually reading about six at a time, so if I yes. get tired with one, I can just pick up the other, and I'll bounce back and forth, and keep me keeps me having a good time. Well, as I said, I'm reading the one now on the Titanic, and I'm also reading Death of a Sales, uh, Death of a Policeman by Ema, by the Brit by that Scottish British writer uh, mm -hmm. in England. Uh, and I tell you, it's, and I'm also going through some literature on the history of the United States. So, I, and people say, well, why do you read two, three, four books at a time? How can you concentrate? Tell them how we concentrate. I tell it very simple. How many people watch more than one serial program? You've got your favorite primetime TV shows. You keep those characters straight, don't you? Absolutely. You, you watch the news. You know, people watch different forms. and Do they keep all that straight? It's no different with a book. It's just uh, you, you, you remember what you've read in the other, and you switch back and forth. It doesn't bother me in the least. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, Mrs. Beaton is a great mystery writer. It's, uh, her detective is a Scottish officer by the name of Hamish Macbeth. Hamish Macbeth. Yes. He's, <laughs> he's a man who, uh, he likes the ladies, and, but every time he gets involved with a, could be a nice romance, mm -hmm. and maybe leading to marriage, something goes wrong. They take offense at something he said or some strange way he's been eating his morning breakfast. and. The romance breaks up, but he has he has a dog and a cat uh, that he loves. So <laughs> he does very well, very well with the dog and the cat. Uh, anyway, uh, as you go down the line, what's the future for David? Well, I would think that I'd love to stay right here in Carlsbad. I'm I'm very happy here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still building and growing First Christian Church. That's that's my first love. Uh, I enjoy teaching and will certainly stay with the college uh, uh, as, as I need to. Yeah. I'm a hospice chaplain for Golden Services and uh, enjoy doing hospice work with them on the side. What do they do exactly? I'm not that familiar with Golden Services. Golden Services, home health, hospice, counseling. Uh, they provide mediation services for uh, divorcing couples, parenting coordination, and some of those uh, quasi-legal services. Mm -hmm. and. They also provide safe exchanges and supervised visitation for children that uh, have parents who need to be supervised and getting getting along. Yeah. Uh, very very involved in in the domestic violence court with that. And, uh, that's a passion of Golden Services. Mm -hmm. I'm on the board of directors of the Battered Family Shelter, so oh, I also that? have a passion for protecting families from uh, from violence. That's a tragic situation, isn't yes. it? And it's nationwide. It is nationwide. And, and it's, it's, we have a, a fabulous shelter here. And, and the girls that staff that shelter are just, I'd put them up against anybody because they are fantastic. Um, and it's an honor to, to be on a board and, and, and serve with them because they are so professional. They are so talented. But they're also so compassionate. And when these families and these, these children come through the shelter that have been uh, had their lives shattered by the atrocity of domestic violence, oh, yes. that staff just really takes them in and, and gives them the support they need. It's a fabulous, fabulous mission. Do you ever go to bed at night and you, you've been into one of those situations and it just can't get it out of your system thinking about it? I just cuddle my wife really tight and she reminds me that it'll be okay. <laughs> She's, she is my strength and my soulmate. I couldn't do anything I do no, without her. <laughs> well, I can say negative things about wives, but uh, in the long run, they're a great poster, banner to 
hang on to because they really get us out of one mess after another usually. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, these young ladies who help uh, the battered shelter, uh, it must be a tough, a tough job just seeing what they have to see every day. It is. It is a very hard job because they're the ones that have to do the intake. They're the ones that listen to the stories. They're the one that understands the depth of the abuse. They're the ones that have to empower these, these people to uh, uh, get back on their feet again. And it's a day-to-day -day process, and it's very, very difficult. But that's why this particular staff of, of women that, that work there are so awesome at what they do because yeah. they never get cold. They never get uh, uh, to the point where they just can't do it anymore. They support one another. And every family that goes into that shelter knows that they are safe. Oh, that's wonderful. What about the poor guys and ladies who don't have a home and they're still wandering around Carlsbad, and especially during these cold nights? Do you ever have to work with any of those folks? Well, the First Christian Church is affiliated with the Carlsbad Transitional Housing Board, mm -hmm. and we are trying very hard as an organization to develop homeless housing and intermediate housing and temporary housing. Um, a lot of the struggles is, is it takes time, it takes money, and it takes the commitment of a community. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to homelessness, a lot of people in the communi a community, not just Carlsbad, yeah. would rather just pretend the problem would go away rather than provide structured housing and, and, and security for yes, these individuals. Right. So it's always a struggle, but the Carlsbad transitional, transitional Housing is working very diligently to make a difference. And uh, the First Christian Church is proud to be a participating congregation. Uh, and we're, we're not the, the most involved of all the churches, but we are one of the participating churches, and, and we've got... Uh, a church member on their board and we're moving forward. Oh, that's, that's good. wonderful. That's wonderful. So the future for David Rogers is going to be something that's going to be surrounding you the way you are now and you'll never get out of it. You'll be that way till as long as I have a good book to read, some Pink Floyd to play, I'm happy. My wife by my side, you know, I, that that's good. <laughs> you, mentioned, you, may, you mentioned Pink Floyd. I love Pink Floyd. What, what was it about his music that you enjoyed so much? It's just, it, it really connected with me at a younger age mm -hmm. and their their passion for, for peace, their passion for justice. It's, it's relevant through a lot of their music. Some of the sonic soundscapes that they create and the, the diversity. You know, Pink Floyd recorded music for 40 years and their, their original albums to their last uh, studio album that came out last year, actually. Mm. Just the, the diversity is wonderful. Did you collect uh, Pink Floyd uh, records when you were growing up? Mm-hmm. And you still have them? I still have them, some of them on vinyl, yes. Oh, listen, <laughs> I'm going to, I found something out just a while back that those uh, original vinyls are selling like hotcakes now because of the covers. Mm-hmm. Beautiful covers, you know. Yeah, and you can't beat Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon for the iconic cover. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, it, do you have any travels uh, lined up in the future? Well, I'll be traveling to uh, Columbus this summer for a church assembly. That's the next one that uh, is on my travel schedule. Is that Columbus, Ohio? Columbus, Ohio, yes. My home state, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So we'll be out there. My wife and I are looking forward to it. We go to all the, for my denomination, all the church assemblies. And that's, that's our next big trip coming up. Funny thing about uh, that situation, when I was growing up in Ohio, Cleveland was the largest city, Cincinnati was second, and Columbus was third. And now it's just the opposite. Columbus is the largest city in Ohio. Is it really? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, when I lived in Kentucky, I was uh, serving a small church just uh, south of Cincinnati mm -hmm. called Butler, Kentucky. And oh, yes. Cincinnati was the town we drove to to do all of our big town shopping. Yeah. It was only 26 miles away. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get a lot of good things to buy there, I trust? Oh, you. love Cincinnati. It's yeah, a great town. It's a pretty city. Right on, the, right on the river. Yes. You can't beat it. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, recently, uh, you were in Santa Fe. You were working with uh, different 
groups. The Bats Brigade. The Bats Brigade. Uh, fill me in a little bit. We have a couple minutes remaining uh, yeah. the, on the Bats Brigade. Fill me in. The Bat Brigade is, is a function of the Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce. And the Bat Brigade goes out every year during the legislative session to meet with the cabinet secretaries, the lieutenant governor, the governor, and some of the commissioners that uh, have offices up there in Santa Fe. Uh, also, as well as to meet with our legislators, yeah. and we go as a, as a group. We pick up a bus here in Carlsbad, Texas, New Mexico Transportation provides a great motor coach that takes us up to Santa Fe and shuttles us around to all the different meetings, and, and <clears throat> a whole group will come in and sit down with a particular cabinet secretary or a, a state official, and we will then present to them in a formal uh, presentation what the needs of Carlsbad and Eddy County are and where our concerns are you know, obviously right now one of our big ones is roads so that was a, a heavily populated meeting mm -hmm. in addition since I am a pastor I have the opportunity to uh, uh, lead the invocation prayer in both the Senate and the House so I usually get that scheduled That's and nice. take turns to uh, lead that and and this particular time I gotta say it's really special for us Carlsbad folks, uh, but uh, I led the prayer in the, the House of Representatives, and that particular day, the Speaker of the House, Don Tripp, had um, relinquished his Speaker's chair for the day to Representative Catherine Brown. Oh, so Carlsbad. I got to sit next to uh, Speaker Brown uh, nice. as she was the Speaker of the day and uh, she was leading the proceedings in the House of Representatives and I got to lead the prayer for the same occasion. It was very special. Oh, that did, Were you able to meet our governor while you were up there also? Uh, the governor's schedule didn't work this year. Last year we did meet with the governor and that was wonderful. Uh, and this year it was the scheduling got a little convoluted but we did meet with the uh, uh, lieutenant governor and had a wonderful meeting with him and uh, it all went well. Oh, that's great. One of the things that I've noticed about roads now since the traffic has been so heavy recently, uh, the white lines separating the different lanes, you can barely see it. And at night, it's almost impossible. And it, are they going to do anything about the painting the yellow and white lines down there for us? I can't speak specifically to that <clears throat> particular issue. I know that uh, there was a very large list of concerns brought to the Secretary of the Department of Transportation. Yeah. Uh, that is a big issue that has has permeated uh, all of us down here. We we have these roads that are just really heavily used, particularly because of the oil and gas industry, and uh, we understand that we need more capital in reinvestment yeah, yeah. into the process so that we can uh, maintain what we have before they're lost altogether. Oh, we just have to keep our fingers crossed because. Uh I just, I hate to see so many accidents happening, and I, you, you never know when it's going to hit you. I saw one the other day, I was crossing down on Canal Street, one of our busiest streets in this whole area, <laughs> and uh, this guy was in a truck and he was going so fast, and a, well, he was following the speed limit, but a car pulled right in front of him, and he slammed on his brakes and he gave him the horn and the guy stopped, thank goodness, because mm -hmm. Uh, somebody would have been hurt seriously in that wreck. And, and that's one of the things we have to remember is, is love them or hate them, the, the, the water trucks and the, the oil field trucks, they're a part of our economy right, right now, they're a part of our community, but you cannot stop an oil field rig as fast as you can stop a little sports car. That's right. And you've got to remember that they need Plenty of room to slow down. You can't oh. just pull up in front of them and expect them to stop on a dime. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> well, let's see. You usually uh, go home at night, and what time do you usually hit the sack? And Do you read while you're in bed? I, I try to make sure I reserve the last hour of the night for reading. Yes, you and me both, and that's a good thing. And that's the way I like to end my day. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> you're going to go home and read those four books tonight. And uh, you're going to enjoy them in about, uh, what, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to actually make it in, in bed by 10, 10.30 yeah. to actually go to sleep. Okay, so. well, listen, I want to thank you for being our <laughs> guest. I've told many people, of all the people with voices in this city, yours is one of the best.
Well, thank you. I, no, I'm uh, serious. <laughs> anyway, David, I You're want to thank kind. you. You're very kind. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure having you here today. Yes, lots of fun. Gosh almighty. Well, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, Channel 23, David and myself, goodbye and good luck. <laughs>